We're going to look at a text of Scripture that has caused no small amount of debate over the centuries. Turn with me to Matthew 22. There are hot-button issues detailed here and described here related to the preaching of the gospel and the response of sinners to obey or reject it. This passage blows up any idea that if you proclaim the biblical truth of the good news and it's rejected, that you need to change your approach or adapt the message so that it's more interesting for the hearers or more winsome in some way. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't be winsome in your gospel declaration and proclamation, but so much of the time you will preach the straight truth to sinners and they will refuse Christ. Don't stop. God's plan of redemption is perfect. And while we may not perfectly convey His truth to a lost and dying world, we know that His Word is powerful to save. And to the extent that we faithfully proclaim God's truth, it's not up to us to ensure the message is received and obeyed. God is the one that causes gospel seed to grow and to bear fruit. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, I planted, Apollo swatted, but God was causing the growth, so then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. So read with me from verse 1 of chapter 22. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, He saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. And the king said to those servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. We see in this that there are many who are invited to the wedding feast. Some will refuse to come. Some will attempt to come on their own terms. And then there are those who are willing to come and come on the Lord's terms. Jesus spoke earlier in his ministry of this great wedding. If you look back at Matthew 9, you'll see in verse 14, that the disciples of John came to Jesus and they asked him, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast. Now that is a prophetic statement about the fact that Jesus is, is a bridegroom to his church. After he was crucified and raised to new life, he would go away for a time as he would ascend to heaven before the marriage supper of the Lamb. John then, in his recording of the revelation of Jesus Christ, says of the return of the Lord, Revelation 19.7, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. That's the church. It's all Jews and Gentiles who believe. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. 
So there will be great celebration among those who attend the wedding feast. The bride is the church and the bridegroom is the Lord Jesus Christ. Note that it says that the church was given fine linen clothing. So it's with that understanding that we interpret our text in Matthew 22. Where he says again, I'm going to give you a parable, you religious men. And the kingdom of heaven may be compared to this. A king who gave a wedding feast for his son. So far, this is a typical ruler who prepares a great celebration for his son. But we know beyond this that our Lord is speaking of the heavenly reality that God sent his son into the world. And that there is a wedding feast prepared for those who are part of the church, those who believe. And so verse 3 says of Matthew 22, and he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast. And this would have been fairly typical in an ancient wedding. There would be those for whom the wedding was prepared and those slaves and servants of the king would begin to make the rounds to gather up those who were invited. It would be a celebratory thing. They would go out and and, uh, speak of the wonder of this Marriage that was to happen. So there were expected guests. Those would include friends and family, as we do for a modern wedding. And they would also include certain classes of people. For example, if there were a king with a great army, perhaps various divisions of military leadership would be invited. And as king, he would have the right to expect anyone that he invited to come. If he were a king over a significant realm, he could expect that representatives from all regions should come. But we look at this first response and we see they were unwilling to come. In these last couple of chapters in Matthew, there are repeated passages with shocking details. The Pharisees and priests and elders would certainly find the parables of Jesus stunning in this regard. And yet, as we see over time, their shock or dismay was never enough to lead them to godly sorrow, followed by repentance. Even as Jesus would identify them with some of the wicked characters in his stories, offense was taken, yes, but godly sorrow producing repentance was not to be expected among them. Jesus was identifying these religious religious leaders with those who were unwilling to come to the king's wedding for his son. After this first group, to which the slaves were sent, refused to come, Jesus says the king sent another group with a more fully formed invitation, verse 4, and he sent other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited all these details. Maybe they will come if they know the joys that they are going to participate in. Behold, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. And the king basically says, tell them how amazing this is going to be. Tell them that the food is prepared and the choicest meats will be served. The fattened livestock, of course, is the best of the best. The fattened calf was what you reserved for your esteemed guests. And notice there is nothing for the guests to do. My oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered. Everything is ready. Come to the feast. You have nothing to bring. Nothing to do. Just enjoy what I am going to do for you. On behalf of my son. This is how it is with the Christian response to the gospel. The Lord says the feast is ready. Come. Come. You can bring nothing but your joy and praise for the Son. Matthew Henry notes that much that is offered as feast to the Christian is in this life, even before the return of Christ. Listen to this. He says, here is a dinner prepared for this marriage. All the privileges of church membership and all the blessings of the new covenant, pardon of sin, favor of God, peace of conscience, the throne of grace, the comforts of the Spirit, and a well-grounded hope of eternal life. These are the preparations for this feast. A heaven upon earth now, and a heaven in heaven shortly. 
You notice that this is now the second call unto the same people. What do we learn from these repeated calls to the feast? But that God has sent His heralds into all the earth repeatedly. He raised up Adam and Noah and Abraham and all the prophets besides to proclaim life and truth to the people that God had declared would be called to be His. And repeatedly calls to this wedding feast have been rejected century after century after millennium. The prophets have been shamed, taunted, and killed literally. Not just in this story. This story points to realities. You always have to remember with the parables about Jesus, of Jesus that they are always pointing to reality. The thing that is the shadow is not the thing itself. The thing itself is often even more detailed and more difficult to comprehend. And that's why we have these simple shadows. It's to help us. By the time we get to the New Testament, there's no surprise that John will be mistreated, John the Baptist, by those called to serve the Lord as well as the Romans. And we'll find in the Gospels and in the book of Acts that the Lord would send out His apostles to call again all who would hear. So we have all of the Old Testament prophets over hundreds and hundreds of years declaring to Israel and even to the nations besides them, come all the ends of the earth and be saved. Enjoy what God has prepared for you. They've rejected them. Then the apostles, all these disciples of the Lord and all of their disciples besides go out. Now, though many came to saving faith, a great number also would refuse this call. And that's exactly what we see here. Though they've been called twice, it says, verse 5, but they paid no attention and went their way. One to his farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. Look at how they are either indifferently or violently opposed, and yet Jesus groups them together as one. They are really the same gang of rebels. And you have to think today, whatever your situation is with the Lord, whatever your relationship to Him, you may say to yourself, well, I'm not violently opposed to Christ's message. I might even like certain things about the church. But I'm not really like those others. I'm just a little more indifferent. Christ groups you in that same camp. James, James Boyce says this, Many who reject the gospel invitation today have equally flimsy excuses as will rightly incur the king's wrath. They say they're too busy for spiritual things. They have fields or patience or bonds or whatever it is that imprisons their souls and keeps them from faith in him who brings salvation. And Boyce goes on to quote Spurgeon who tells of a ship owner who was visited by a godly man. And he says, the Christian asked, well, sir, what is the state of your soul? To which the merchant replied, Soul? I have no time to take care of my soul. I have time only enough to take care of my ships. But he was not too busy to die, which he did a week later. Look at how also they seize his slaves. Remember in the previous passage that we've come through, Jesus warned them that they would seize and kill the prophets. He was telling the Pharisees and the elders and the chief priests, just as your fathers did to the prophets, so you will do to the apostles and to those who come in my name. And even after speaking plain truths to them, you'll remember they literally wanted to seize Jesus. Look at verse 46, when they sought to seize him. Now they didn't because what? They had a fear of man. So Jesus was telling them, you are going to, to seize and abuse the righteous. And they 
prove him right by desiring to seize him, to seize him, to arrest him, or to harm him. Those who are perverse in their morality are often violent in their tendencies toward Christ and his people. And by the way, usually those who are super indifferent to Jesus will not remain that way. In fact, if you are exposed more and more to the gospel message, your conscience will be inflamed. And you have two options. You can surrender to Christ or you can batten down the hatches and begin to be violently opposed to Christ. Those are your options. Verse 7, now the king responds. It says the king was enraged and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. This is the king's judgment. It is not acceptable to refuse audience with the king or to refuse his edicts. In the parable, armies destroyed those who refused the king and his son and destroyed their city. We can even understand in this that Jesus was aware that those standing before him to reject him would undergo judgment in their lifetimes, even before judgment day, because in 70 AD, the Romans would burn and destroy the holy city of Jerusalem and slaughter those leaders who rejected Christ. Not because the Romans were avenging Christ, but because God in his sovereignty ordained that Christ would be raised up after the crucifixion, but the city would be cast down for her rejection of God's word concerning his son. Now, the Romans meant only evil, and they were evil. But God always in his sovereignty controls the way that the outcome occurs and happens. And so we see that the destruction of the city was something that Jesus could foretell. And he talked about the destruction of his own body. Destroy this temple and it will be raised up in three days. But he was looking to that destruction also of the physical temple. Then the king said to his slaves, verse 8, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Here we learn something of the king's heart toward those who refuse his kindness, they show themselves unworthy. Now, in our theology, we have something curious at play here because those who come to the wedding are not in themselves any more worthy. As we go on, you'll see that they do not have anything but their presence to honor the king with. And yet those who come are counted worthy. But here it says the king... The king says, the wedding will go ahead, but not with many that I have invited. Go, therefore, to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. And so those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found. Well, they called for all who were worthy to come, right? No, look, they gathered all they found, both what? Evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. Maybe the translators in English got this wrong, both evil and good. Is evil something that could be translated as not special or something else? No, the Greek is paneros, which is quite literally referring to those who are morally corrupt and wicked. The word for good, agathos, which again is a proper translation, it refers to those who have morally positive qualities. But you have to remember who this parable is taught to. Jesus is teaching the Pharisees and temple leaders, and he is clearly giving them an image of all those who are being called, expecting them to conceive of it according to their own standard of good and evil. And we've learned, haven't we, that their standard is upside down. They believe their own hypocritical lives are somehow good. And that the obvious sinners like the tax collectors and the prostitutes, those are the evil ones. And even the poor and the lame and the sick in their books were also great sinners, weren't they? Otherwise, they would not have such poverty or such place of lowliness in society. They would be blessed. They would have honor. So from their perspective in this parable... The king is inviting all those that the Pharisees despised into the wedding feast. But he's also calling 
all those they believe are like them. Come to the wedding of my son. But don't miss this. Both the wicked and the evil, by their perspective, are invited. You will see as you read the New Testament, not only those who knew their poverty because they had nothing and came to Christ, but those who also originally did not know their poverty, having every earthly privilege like Saul of Tarsus or Nicodemus, they came to know of their spiritual poverty They came to see themselves as poneros, as evil, and they came, and they trusted the king. Verse 11, but when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, now here are those who have actually decided, okay, I'm going to come to the invitation, I'm going to come to this wedding. The king came in, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. Now, it seems that the king supplied the wedding clothes. If we have to use our imagination, we understand that even in a parallel passage in Luke, the the poor and destitute are invited in. They don't have wedding clothes. So for the king to be upset for somebody not to be in wedding clothes must mean that the king was one who provided them. From our theology, we understand that indeed the church will be given new clothes, new garments, garments of righteousness. But there's one here among them who is not in the proper clothing. It also aligns with other theological points, but we'll keep it simple for now. Romans 13 says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Even now, the Christian is called to put on Christ. We, we have this idea of wearing garments even now, even though in, in the end we will be given garments of white. Put on the righteousness of God. That's the idea even now. But this man, the king discovered, came on his own terms. He wanted the benefits of the king, but wanted to remain as he was. You know, you have that that very well-known song, Come as you are, but friends, don't stay as you are. Christ bids you come and be changed. Be transformed. He wanted the benefits, but not to change. How many today are even part of the church in a visible way, yet are unwilling to come fully to Christ on His own terms. How many are here, but in their hearts are far from God, far from His Son, Jesus. And so what's the king's response to this? Verse 12, he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Commentators have noted that He was able to make it in. So somehow his servants did not notice that he was not as the others were. And it reminds us that only God knows your inward state. Only God knows what is going on in your heart. And so there will be those in the end who are found who have never turned and repented. The prophet Habakkuk speaks of idols which are speechless. It says the man was speechless when the king spoke to him. The idols are speechless. The idols are speechless because they are not gods at all, but are pieces of wood and metal and stone fashioned by human hands and have no benefit except to ensnare those who make them. Likewise, all those who see God on the last day unprepared will be speechless. They will be as the mute idols who have benefited no one, including themselves, and will not utter a word. And the king said to his servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We must speak of both heaven and the joys of heaven and hell and the terrors of it. Charles Spurgeon says of 
preachers who will not mention hell. He says, there are some ministers who never mention anything about hell. I heard of a minister once who said to his congregation, if you do not love the Lord Jesus, you will be sent to that place which it is not polite to mention. He ought not to be allowed to preach again. I am sure if he would not use plain words. Now, if I saw that house on fire over there, do you think I would stand and say, I believe the operation of the combustion is proceeding yonder? No, I would call out fire, fire. Spurgeon says, and then everyone would know what I meant. So if the Bible says the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness Am I to stand here and mince the matter at all? God forbid we must speak the truth as it is written. It is a terrible truth, for it says the children of the kingdom shall be cast out. Now who are those children? I will tell you. The children of the kingdom are those people who are noted for the externals of piety, but who have nothing of the internals of it. People whom you will see with their Bibles and hymn books marching off to chapel as religiously as possible or going to church as devoutly and demurely as they can. Spurgeon goes on to speak then of those who will end up in torments. And he says many of them will go there with their mother's tears in their hair and their father's prayers at their heels. But they will avail nothing for them Because they personally have not surrendered to Christ. Nothing will change the fact that they never had true religion, true faith in Jesus Christ within their soul. The fact is that Jesus spoke much of eternal condemnation and we ministered deficiently to to neglect his words. Matthew 8, turn back there for a moment. In fact, look at Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Isn't that in perfect alignment with our passage today? Verse 11 of chapter 8. I say to you that many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. In their, that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Just as Spurgeon refers to there. In many other places, Jesus speaks of these realities. Next, Jesus summarizes his parable in Matthew twenty two fourteen, and ultimately his lesson. For many are called, but few are chosen. What you find in this parable of Jesus is that the thesis comes at the end. He speaks of a wedding and the results of refusing the king and his son, the honor that's due them. This relates, of course, to the Pharisees and priests and elders of the people also. And Jesus summarizes both the parable and eternal truth by saying, for many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called to the wedding feast in this parable. And many are called to the wedding feast of the Lamb when Christ and His bride, the church, shall be joined forever. Now, if you think that the amount of words spoken relate to their importance, you'll miss this as an arbitrary detail. Here is a terse statement, quick and to the point. But you should recognize in this a pattern in Scripture to succinctly summarize the truth of the whole passage. At times in Scripture, the thesis or statement of truth comes at the beginning and is followed by an explanation. So, for example, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then it's expounded. It's sort of blown up for you how he did that. That begins our Bible. At other times... The thesis or summary of truth comes somewhere between the start and the end of the text. John's gospel, John famously leaves his purpose statement for his entire gospel in the penultimate chapter. It isn't until until the chapter uh, of 20, John 20, after we learn of the incredible miracles of Jesus and his glorious call to be saved 
and his earth-shaking I am statements that Jesus, that John uh, tells us the point of this. And he says in John 20, verse 30, Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's the whole purpose of the gospel. And it comes very far into it. That's both the reason for the gospel of John and the summary of the message in one statement. Jesus is the Christ. He's the Son of God. Believe in him and you will have life in his name. And so it is in our text in Matthew 22 that after much has been said concerning the wedding banquet, the father, the son, the slaves, and the guests, and the refusers, the key theme is pronounced, for many are called, but few are chosen. This simple statement is in fact a reality that can be seen through all Scripture. There is a remnant among Israel, and there is a remnant among the nations. These are the chosen, the believer, the friend of Jesus, the true disciple. This is a difficult concept for the world today. Those that are called but are not chosen are those who refuse to obey the call. They are the opposite of Abraham, of whom the Scripture says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Genesis 12.1, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. Hebrews, looking on that call, says, Hebrews 11.8, by faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Can you imagine that kind of faith? Abraham, I want you to go out to a place of which I will show you. I have no idea where I'm going, but the Lord has called me. I'm going to go. Those are... The ones who are called and obey, those who are called but do not obey are the lost. They are the rebellious, the unrighteous, the wicked. We don't like to think about the fact that the world itself largely rejects truth. Many who reject the lordship of Jesus Christ will embrace him in some superficial fashion so as to hedge their bets. In fact, as you're seeing the most perverse wickedness come out into the world, what are they saying? My Jesus says, I can do this. That's what the most blasphemous things people are doing is being framed with. The Jesus that I follow allows me to do this kind of sin. Well, everyone wants to have their fun and avoid hell at the same time. But they do not belong to the Lord and will be known as the wicked in the end. But who are these who are called and chosen? You'll first notice that the term called in this case does not necessarily refer to a believer. In this passage, there are those who are called who do not follow and obey the Father. How do we reconcile this with other scriptures which seem to say that those who are the called are believers. Well, we do so by recognizing that one word has different meanings in different contexts. Um, In fact, there are words in the English language that have several dozen meanings depending on context. And so we're going to look at that here. Think about, though, as an example, the word day. I can say to you, back in my day, when we read Scripture, we learned about how God made the world in six literal days. We could marvel day and night until the day of the Lord. Now, is any of that confusing to you? No, you understood that I'm using day in different meanings there. I've used the word day there with liberty to put into your mind four different meanings, and I don't think you misunderstood what I said, even though I said it in the span of a few seconds. Back in my day refers to an earlier period of my life. Six days of creation refer to to literal 24-hour days. Day and night refers to the contrast between the light hours of the day and the evening hours, the dark hours. And the day of the Lord is a specific prophetic date at which time the Lord will judge the world. And my point is we frequently utilize words 
with multiple meanings, but we should not be confused as to which definition or connotation we have in mind. So we should be able to arrive at a clear definition, definition of words in Matthew twenty two fourteen. Much of the debate over the sovereignty of God in salvation versus the responsibility of man in salvation hinges on meanings which can be definitively known. This is why I have great confidence in my theology is because when you look at words in context and you exegete them, you bring out of them what the meaning of the original text is, you can know. We have too many preachers nowadays that are giving you messages where they say, well, about a third of the Bible we can know for sure, and the beginning parts and the end parts, those are super tough to understand. Uh, For example, with day, just to continue the example, day in the Old Testament, 100% of the time can be understood, whether it's literal or figurative, based on a few simple principles. So anytime the word day has evening or morning or a number connected to it throughout Genesis through Malachi, it always refers to a literal day. And the way to get away from that in Genesis 1 is people ignoring that that's the exegetical pattern for the entire rest of the Scriptures. So you literally have to do gymnastics to go back and say, well, this is poetry. Revelation is the same. There are things that are spoken like a literal millennium, a literal thousand-year reign of Christ, and when we understand context, we can come to a proper meaning, which means we can proclaim all of Scripture. And isn't that a little bit more exciting than saying, well, I love the gospel, so we'll just preach a portion of the gospel. The problem is that the gospel comes in the beginning and the end as well. So back to the word called. In this context, called is speaking of the call that goes out to all. Related to salvation, called in Scripture tends to refer either to the external call of the gospel proclamation or to the internal call of the true believer. Turn to Romans 1 for a moment. Listen to how Paul introduces himself in the epistle to the Romans. Paul, a bondservant of Christ. By the way, that word in the Greek is literally slave. We're going with our themes today of who have been sent. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. If few are called and chosen as wedding guests, guests, fewer still have been called prophets or apostles. And this is the same word called, kletos. For Paul to be called an apostle meant that he was not just named an apostle. He was called on the road to Damascus to salvation and to fulfill the ministry of an apostle, which is to say he was chosen to be part of co-laboring with the other apostles to lay the foundation for the church. And he did so in his gospel work and testimony, in his planning of churches, and for our benefit in his writing of more than a dozen epistles in the New Testament. But this chapter in Romans, stay there, gives us both the narrower definition of one called to be an apostle, as well as the more common designation of all those who are called believers. So look at the entire paragraph. I, Paul, called as an apostle of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. Among you also are the called, of Jesus Christ. This is not the general category. This is the specific, those who are in Christ, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So Paul says, I am among the called, called as an apostle to minister to the called, that's you. You are the called of Christ Jesus. In that sense, call means believer. You are beloved of God, called saints. Those are equivalents. In that sense, the term called is not referring merely to an external call, but since those called in Romans are the beloved of God as saints, they are the set-apart ones, the holy ones, those who believe. It can be said biblically that anyone who is called in this sense is chosen. These are the true believers. Now turn to Revelation 17. In this passage, in the last days, the wicked of the earth, led by the beast, will set themselves against Jesus Christ. I told you that there is no ultimate neutrality with Christ. If you continue down your rebellious indifference to Christ, your indifference eventually, if you don't die, will wax worse and worse They set themselves against Jesus Christ, and the Bible's description of that event describes the believers as both called and chosen. Verse 14 of chapter 17, these will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them because He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who were with Him are the called and chosen, and one more word, faithful. The word for faithful there is where we get our word for those who believe or who trust. We who are with Christ in the end are called the chosen, the faithful. In Matthew 22, when our text says, for many are called, but few are chosen, we see it means there a narrower definition of called. It is saying that the the actual guests who remain in the end are called and chosen. To use the language of the parable, it means that many are invited to the wedding, but few will be counted as chosen guests. Now, there are even extra biblical Jewish proverbs that convey this identical idea based on biblical knowledge. So the pseudepigraphic 2nd Esdras 8.1 says this, The Most High made this world for the sake of many, but the world to come for the sake of few. It also says, Two verses later, many are created, but few are saved. In the Hebrew Scriptures and in the the Hebrew writings outside of the Bible, these kinds of ideas have been understood over the millennia. Now, some might think it unfair that vast numbers are given the invitation to the wedding feast, but few enjoy the great occasion. But this story actually helps us to see the responsibility of those called. They have rejected the invitation. They will not be able to say to God, you didn't allow me to come. For the invitation was open to all. This is yet another occasion where Jesus teaches a parable that highlights the rebellion of the religious rulers. And Jesus emphasizes their rebellion in this text, and that's why I'm focusing on that. We always, when we interpret a text... We want to know what is the main thrust of the text. You know what the main thrust is? God is so gracious. He has prepared a bountiful feast. He has invited you. He has bid you come without price. Come without money. Enjoy. But you have refused. That's what the text is showing While there are many who will hear the call of the gospel message, there are few who will believe. So much so that Jesus says, for many are called, but few are chosen. You get that straight and narrow way and the narrow gate idea in there. But it is also a recognition that we must spread the gospel far and wide and diligently labor to invite as many as are willing to come to the wedding feast. I'm aware that many of us in this church, having been brought together by certain circumstances over the past few years, have come from churches that are either nonspecific in their doctrine of salvation, some of them, or teach a poor substitute for how we're saved. 
We are saved by the mercy of God, nothing else. We are not saved by something in us. We have not done something that he should desire for us more than others to be saved. We're saved by mercy. Exodus 34 says that. I, uh, I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. Turn to Luke 18. We've looked at this before, but I'm going to show you something that I think many struggle with. And I hope with our passage today, that context will come out a little bit more clearly. And I hope it helps you. Luke 18, verse 10. You know this well. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now someone will worry about this almost mystically as they see in this the potential not to be like the Pharisee and to thank God for salvation, or worse, someone might think that from this you can't really be sure of your salvation or else you might be like this Pharisee thanking God that he's among the righteous. But allow me to share with you the gospel truth that you will thank God for your salvation if you are mature in faith and doctrine. But don't miss the entire point of the parable in Luke and ours in Matthew 22. What is, God, what is the Pharisee thanking God for specifically? He is thanking God. Is he thanking him for humbling himself and making him his own? No, far from it. The Pharisee says, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Do you hear that? I thank you that I'm not like others. What did the parable of Jesus, of the king and his son's banquet, teach us? That those who are invited are all alike invited. And the truth is, because they are all alike under condemnation, they are only visibly better off or worse off one than the, one or the other. Romans 3, what does it say? As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. The Pharisee's problem was he didn't see himself in that group. Everybody's a sinner except for the Pharisee. The Pharisee in the temple praying to himself should have rather said, not I thank you that I'm not like others, but I thank you, God, that though I am just like every other sinner, you saved me by your mercy. I thank you that I'm among the company of the redeemed. Not I thank you that I have made myself Righteous by my works. You showed me mercy and compassion. You gave me rest and peace with God. Turn to 1 Corinthians 1. This is who we are. We are the, the poor and the despised Verse 26, for consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world, and the despised God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are so that no man may boast before God. 
but by his doing you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. The Pharisee boasted in himself. You, I pray, will boast in the, the Lord's goodness to save you. Lord, I thank you that being as all the others Yet you save me. In fact, I thank you, Father, that being as the worst among sinners, even so you saved me. Let's pray. Father, the more that I read your word, the more that I am confronted with my own sinfulness. And I know that there are many in this room, in this building, who feel the same. They read your word and your words remind them of where they came from. And yet, such grace has been poured out that you have called us justified. You have even said in your word that we are glorified. Speaking of the sense that we are perfectly in Christ. We are perfectly raised from the dead of our sin raised up and even ascended with Him. We are in Christ in as much as we are in His salvation and His work that He has done for us. He has accomplished the atonement for our sins. Father, I thank You that we no longer have shame for our sin. That though we are just like everyone else, we are sinners, yet we are justified by grace through faith in Christ to the glory of God. I thank you that every day we can marvel that we do not bear shame, that we do not bear guilt, that we will never receive one drop of the punishment of the wrath of God because you, O Lord Jesus, drank down every last drop right to the dregs of the cup of the wrath of the Father on our behalf. You stood in our place so that we would never suffer that. And we know now, yes, we are disciplined by our Father because we are His children. But we are not punished any longer as we would have been. We do not have that same hammer hanging over our heads. God, what a wonder it is that we could be Yours. And what a wonder that we no longer have the same desires to sin. That when we come to you, when you draw us to yourself and we by your mercy also respond, we no longer have those same strong desires to sin. Though we fall into sin, we no longer dive into sin. And we know that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins. What else could we want? And yet you give us everything besides. You give us the fellowship of the saints. We have the joy here even this morning of being able to encourage one another and build up one another. We have the joy of knowing that heaven is soon to be ours. We have the joy of knowing that we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us, who comforts us, who aids us in every part of our sanctification and enables that work and who will perfect us until the day of Christ Jesus. And it is to that day that we look. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen.